uh, listen, y'all. I'm just if you if you haven't made your your summer plans yet to to go somewhere, if you're gonna fly. Listen, you've got to get an extra couple tickets for, for Sean and Austin. You just, listen, that will make the trip. Okay, that'll be the most fun of the whole trip. I don't care where you're going. you got to take those two. For example, the first flight coming back. <laughs> we get on the plane. <laughs> and Sean sits down. And I guess I guess he felt the uh, the armrest. And it just started just, just wiggling. And it was just going all over the place. And man, he just... From right there, you know, it was it was it was over. He, he was already, you know, a little bit on edge, you know. Then, then that starts moving, and then and then the uh, the uh, tray table, it's doing the same thing, you know. It's like nothing's fixed, I mean, nothing's nothing's solid. Well, anyway, the the, the uh, flight attendant starts walking down. You know, she's shutting all the overhead compartments, and she gets to, she gets the one. And it just almost just comes completely off, right? It just almost came completely off. By then, Sean's like, just get me off of here. Listen, I'll, I'll find another way. And, you know, Greyhound's got to come through Amarillo. I mean, just let me off this plane. And listen, the takeoff, on the, i got to give him this. The, the takeoff of that, of that trip was rough. It was rough. And if you've ever been there, anybody ever been to Amarillo? Listen, you can see next week. When you're in Amarillo, there is nothing. There's nothing blocking the wind. There's nothing, and so uh, man, it was uh, it was quite the ride. And I know Chrissy was was you know uh, Austin's telling her about the trip, and she's like, yeah, whatever, you know, just giving him a hard time. But I'll vouch for some of these things. But listen, it, it was it was comical. That was probably the most fun of the whole trip was just <laughs> being able to sit next to them and watch them, you know, squirm a little bit as the as the plane takes off, and so it was it was a good time. Anyway, let's jump right in. Uh, man, uh, baggage. You know, I've, I've got a lot of uh, bags here. We're going to uh, begin a, a series today called Summer Baggage as we get into summer, and some of us uh, are, are making plans and and. And uh, planning trips, and and with planning trips comes with uh, luggage. You know things that you have to pack, and you know you always have to pack the right things. And uh, just for as an example, if I would have never uh, looked at the weather before last week, I, I would have packed wrong because it was nice down here, but it was 28 degrees in Amarillo. Wow. You know I would have never properly packed. For that trip had I not prepared myself and so anyway so so the summer is going to uh, come at us uh, real quick and uh, as we plan our summers out and plan our trips we have to uh, to make sure that uh, we have the right uh, things packed and so a lot of us Miss Kathy uh, we like to uh, we like to carry everything we like to, to put our whole closet into our bags, right? We want to carry everything we have because you never know, right? Exactly. You never know. You might you might think you want to wear this tomorrow, but really when tomorrow comes, you want to wear this, right? And so if you don't have this, you're in trouble. And so a lot of us, we want to uh, we, we want to take everything. And uh, you know, if you think about your life, uh, a lot of us try to go through each and every day holding on to everything. We want to hold on to everything. We want to hold on to the good. We want to hold on to the bad. We want to hold on to the to the ugly. We want to hold on to everything. And, and what happens is, is we find ourselves with a lot of baggage. You know, I would never need all of this baggage. So why would I want to carry all of this baggage with me in, in my life? It, it becomes too heavy. It, it becomes too much. It becomes way more than I ever use or need or even have time to, to look at. I mean, and so in my life, why would I want to do the same thing? Why would I want to hold on to everything? Why would I want to hold on to that failure? Why, why would I want to hold on to that regret? Well, why would I want to hold on to that anger? Why, why would I want to hold on to that unforgiveness. Why, why do I want to hold on to these things? And yet that's exactly what I do. I continually hold on to these things. Why? Because for some of us it gives us a sense of control of the situation. If I'm angry at you, I've got a little bit of control over the situation when I when I have to look at you or talk to you or 
or relate to you in, in some way. And so for some of us, it, 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 it fuels us when we hold on to, to some of these things. But, but God desired us. He, he, he never desired us to carry those things. He never desires uh, for us to carry the anger, to carry the, the, uh, the depression, to carry the, the loneliness, to carry uh, the failure that, that, we, that we've experienced in our life. In, in fact, He desires just the opposite. He desires for us to live in the overflow. Amen. He desires us to live on that part that's overflowing. That's where He wants, that's where he wants us to be. He, he desires for us to lay down the lesser things for the greater things. He desires that for us. He wants us to always give our best. To show us that there's always something more and better that He wants to give back to us. You see, these last uh, few weeks we've been in a series talking about this relationship. And this relationship really, guys, is easy. Because on one end of this relationship is a perfect God. A God of mercy. A God of grace. A God of forgiveness. And when we come to Him and we repent and we ask for forgiveness, He always gives it. This is the easy relationship. This right here is the difficult one. And this is the one that we're going to spend the next few weeks talking about because what's the problem with this relationship? <coughs> neither one of us are God. Neither one of us are perfect. And neither one of us are going to get it right all the time. We're going to get hurt. We're going to get offended. We're going to get mad. Something's going to happen to where this relationship right here is going to be affected. It's going to be impacted. That's not what God wants for us. So a lot of us are carrying baggage that God never intended for us to carry. We've said some of these things. Uh, some others are fear. A lot of us are carrying fear. A lot of us are carrying some kind of a hurt. We've been hurt by somebody, failure, shame and regret, as I've said. And there's others. There's, there's, there's a long list of things. And you might be thinking about that right now. As I'm, as I'm saying some of these things, you're thinking, oh yeah, well, I've got this too you know, that I'm dealing with. And today I'm going to specifically talk about unforgiveness. We're going to talk about unforgiveness. You may not know this, but uh, unforgiveness is a powerful weapon of the enemy. See, his desire is to hinder us from advancing the kingdom. And unforgiveness is one of those things that, that the enemy uses to prevent us from advancing the kingdom. Think about it this way. The enemy will use unforgiveness to rot us from the inside out. You may be able to walk around life and nobody knows that you're dealing with unforgiveness. Nobody knows that you're carrying this weight of unforgiveness. But on the inside, the enemy is using it to rot us away. And so how do we deal with unforgiveness? Well, if you have your Bibles... Turn to Matthew chapter 18. And we're going to look at a parable here that's going to give us some, uh, some observations, some, some, some tips on how we, can, uh, how we can deal with unforgiveness. So Matthew chapter 18, starting in verse 21, it says that Peter approached him and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? As many as seven? Sounds like a good number. I tell you, not as many as seven, Jesus replied, but 77 times. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle accounts, 
one who owed 10,000 talents was brought before him. Since he did not have the money to pay it back, his master commanded that he, his wife, his children, and everything he had be sold to pay the debt. At this, the servant fell face down before him and said, Be patient with me, and I will pay you everything. Then the master of that servant had compassion, released him, and forgave him the loan. That servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii, and he grabbed him, started choking him, and said, Pay what you owe. At this, his fellow servant fell down and began begging him, Be patient with me, and I will pay you back. But he wasn't willing. Instead, he went and threw him into prison until he could pay what was owed. When the other servants saw what had taken place, they were deeply distressed and went and reported to their master everything that had happened. Then, after he had summoned him, his master said to him, You wicked servant! I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Shouldn't you also have had mercy on your fellow servant? as I had mercy on you? And because he was angry, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he could pay everything that was owed. So also my heavenly Father will do to you unless every one of you forgives his brother or sister from your heart. From your heart. Okay, so I've got five observations that I want to, uh, to, to take out of this parable. The first one is this. If you take notes, write this down. God only asks us to do what He has already done. God will only ask us to do that which He has already done. So, first, so, so we start out, Peter says, well, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? How about seven? Well, I tell you, not as many as seven, Jesus replied, but 77 times. So the interpretation here is not 77 times, but every time. Every time. Every time somebody sins against you, forgive them. And I think it's interesting here that there's, there's no reference to, uh, to what they did, the sin that was committed against him. And, and there's no reference to whether or not they ask for forgiveness. It, it seems to leave that out. We don't know what sin they committed, and we don't know if they asked for forgiveness. And Jesus says, forgive them anyway. Forgive them anyway. It may be the most horrible sin that you and I can think of. Forgive them anyway. They, they may not ask for it. They may not even think they did anything wrong. Forgive them anyway. We can do that because God has already forgiven us. The Romans 5, uh, 6 through 8, uh, tells us that for a while we were still helpless, at the appointed moment, Christ died for the ungodly. For rarely will someone die for just a person. Though for a good person, perhaps someone might even dare to die. But God proves His own love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And we know that through Christ. A death on the cross gives us the opportunity for Him to forgive us of our sins. Long before we've ever asked for it. He forgave us of our sins when He died on the cross. And so see, He can tell us. He can require us. He can command us to forgive others because He's forgiven us. He never asked us, what sin did you commit? I don't think I'll die for that one. Wait, you didn't ask for, for, I don't think I'll die because you didn't ask for forgiveness. I he didn't wait for that. And he's, not, and he's asking us not to wait for that as well. He says forgive 77 times. 70 times 7. Every time. You see, our flesh, our flesh wants to do everything but forgive. Our flesh doesn't want to forgive. Our flesh wants to get even. Our flesh wants to get back. Our flesh wants to do to you what you did to me 
Only I'm going to do it worse. That's what our flesh wants. Jesus says, no. Forgive. Second observation is this. Forgiveness advances the kingdom of God. Forgiveness advances the kingdom of God. Verse 23 says, for this reason, forgiveness, the kingdom of heaven can be compared to the rest of the story here. Because of forgiveness, the kingdom of God can be advanced. So how does forgiveness advance the kingdom? Well, we need to know that forgiveness is a supernatural power. It's a, it's a spiritual power that is on display. One of, one of the most powerful tools that we have as believers is the power of forgiveness. For us, as well as the person that we're forgiving. You know how powerful it is when we can go up to somebody and say, I forgive you? In essence, I release you. I set you free. You, you were found not guilty. I've seen many uh, shows where, uh, documentaries where uh, uh, two families will come together. One is, is the one that committed a violent crime against his family. Maybe murder. Maybe rape. Maybe something else. But eventually they were able to reconcile with the family and build a relationship. That's the power of forgiveness. Forgiveness advances the kingdom of God. It's a powerful tool that we have as believers. The third observation is this. The debt that I owed is far greater than the debt owed me. We, 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 need, to, we need to understand that right there. We need to know that the debt that we owe is far greater than the debt anybody will ever owe us. Nobody will ever sin against us so great that it goes beyond the debt that, that we owe God. Yeah. You may be thinking, you don't know what was done or said to me. I don't have to know what was done or said to you. Look at verse 24. When he began to settle accounts, one who owed 10,000 talents was brought before him. Now that may not mean anything to you. But back then, a talent was a very large sum. In fact, 10,000 talents was the largest figure in ancient accounting. It didn't go past 10,000 talents. He used the largest number available. In, in other words, this is an impossible debt to repay. He can't do it. He didn't make enough money to repay this debt. And I think that's one reason why he said, okay, I'm going to send you, and not just you, I'm going to send your, your wife, your, your, your uh, children, and, and everything that you have. Because you're still going to be short. You're still going to be 9,000 talents short. In other words, it's an impossible debt to repay. That's the debt we owed. The debt that we owed was impossible to repay. That's why God had to send His only Son, Jesus Christ, to come down here, live a perfect life, die on the cross for our sins. Because we owed a debt that was impossible to repay. Look at verse 28. Verse 28 says, uh, he says, that servant went out, so th this is after he'd been forgiven of this impossible debt, he goes out, and he finds one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. Grabbed him, started choking him, and said, pay what you owe. All right, so 10,000 talents to a hundred denarii. We're talking about an impossible amount to repay versus a day's wage. This was common. This was, this was pennies. This is what they made in a day. And yet, 
He goes out there and demands that he, be, that, that he is repaid. We don't know what, was, what had happened, but he's in debt. A debt that's manageable, a debt that can be repaid, no problem. It's a day's wage. Those are the debts that we incur between each other. They're pennies. And I'm not, I'm not trying to tell you that there are some in, in, incredibly difficult situations that we find ourselves in. But I am telling you, based on this, that it is possible to be able to forgive no matter what. Because the debts that we owe each other will never reach the level of the debt that we have against our Lord and Savior. You see, we want to be treated differently. See, we, we want people to forgive us. I mean, this guy, he, he fell on his knees, begged for mercy, and he was forgiven. Well, the guy that owes him money fell on his knees, asked for mercy, and he choked him out. You see, we want to be in control. We, we want to decide if we're going to forgive or not. We want to be in control of the situation. We, we want to have some kind of leverage over the person that's hurt us. Pennies. If I if I came up to one of y'all and said, "I'm I'm sorry, I, I owe you a, I owe you a couple of pennies," he'd be like, "Oh man, no big deal. Don't worry about it." That, that's the attitude that we would take. We don't care about pennies. So when the debts between us are the same size. Why is it so difficult for us to say, you know what? It's forgiven. Don't worry about it. I forgive you. Here's the fourth observation. Being told to forgive someone who has violated us can be hard and it can be scary. Again, verse 28. That servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. He grabbed him. Started choking him. And said, pay what you owe. See, we want to hold on to that to the hate that we have for that person that's wronged us. But we want to hold on to it. See, we think that getting back and getting even, we think, we think it feels better. We, we, there, there's a saying, revenge is sweet. Because that's how we think. We, we think if we can get back at the person, we'll feel better. But do we? We don't. Maybe, maybe in that moment, like, I got it. But listen, when, it, when everything settles down, think about the relationship that's, that's, that's ruined. Think about the things that have been lost because, because we couldn't just forgive. We, we, had to, we had to hold on. We had, to, we had to turn our love into hate because they messed up. Because they made a mistake. The fifth thing is this. The fifth observation is this. Judgment is without mercy to the one who has not shown mercy. Judgment is without mercy to the one who has not shown mercy. Look at verse 31. When the other servants saw what had taken place, they were deeply distressed and they went and reported to their master everything that had happened. Then after he had summoned him, his master said to him, You wicked servant, 
I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Shouldn't you also have mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And because he was angry, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he could pay everything that was owed. So also my heavenly Father will do to you unless every one of you forgives his brother or sister from your heart. Mark 11, 25 says this. He says, and whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him so that your Father in heaven will also forgive you your wrongdoing. And James 2.13, which is this observation, says this, judgment is without mercy to the one who has not shown mercy. If you and I can't show mercy to one another, if we can't forgive one another, God can't forgive us. God can't show us mercy. But there is good news. There is good news. The good news is this. The good news is that forgiveness is a process. I think God understands how difficult it is for us to forgive one another. I think He knows how hard it is for us to say, I forgive you when something tragic has happened. And He is willing to walk us through a process to help us to get to the point where we can move past the hurt. And we just have to understand that this is a spiritual battle. Okay, in our flesh, it's almost it's impossible for us to be able to walk out forgiveness the way that God wants to walk, help us walk it out. And so God is willing to give us the strength that we need. To help us to forgive this person. And the way he does it is by praying. God will give us the strength to begin to pray for the person that has hurt us or wronged us or offended us or violated us. He will give us the strength to be able to begin praying for them. And as he provides the strength, He will, he, will, he will get us to the place where we can even begin to pray blessings for that person. And then as you spend time covering them in prayer, you'll be able to forgive and to release the bitterness to which you are tightly clinging to. It doesn't happen overnight. But as you and I, as, as we begin the process of praying for this person, of eventually getting to the point where we can pray blessings over these people, this person, God will help us. God will give us the strength to lay aside this bitterness that, that's, in our, that's in our luggage that we're carrying around with us. He'll help us to be able to take it out and get rid of it. So, let me say it another way. Yesterday, um, I had an experience uh, yesterday morning. Um, I was uh, a, a part of our, our serve team that went out, and uh, the place that we went to was Miss Miss Francis' house. Miss Francis, that sits over here, um, she had a a, a large uh, stump in her yard that needed to be uh, removed, and so. You know, I go, and, and, and Shannon comes along, and he brings his little toy tractor that he has, and, and I'm just standing around, you know, watching Shannon have a good time and do all the work, you know, I'm just standing around. And so I've got nothing to do, and all of a sudden, I just start thinking about this stump and what it represents. And I start, you know, looking around, and, and, and over here where there used to be a home, there's no longer a home there, it's gone. And I look a little further, and there's some uh, there's some more stumps, and some some uh, resemblances of what used to be trees laying on the ground. And uh, you know, I, I got I got to thinking about how all this kind of relates to life, because at one time the, this stump was a beautiful tree. At, at one time these 
These uh, these stumps over here down on the on the ground dead were, were at one time were beautiful trees that you know they, they, they provided shade from the hot sun. They they gave uh, birds nest nesting ground for their for their homes and and, and squirrels to be able to, to, to live in these trees and and who knows maybe a maybe a tire swing a home from one of these trees at one time and maybe who knows maybe kids were climbing these trees and, and just beautiful trees and, and and just reminded me of, of our life sometimes when everything's going our way we're, we're like these beautiful trees your life is good we got we got the family we want we got the job we want we got the house we want we, 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 we like our financial position we like the neighborhood that we live in. We like the city that we live in. Everything is good. And then the storm comes. Right? The storm comes and it, and, it, and it damages these trees. And I'm thinking, man, that could be that one moment in our life where somebody violates us. Maybe a, maybe a spouse walks out on us. Maybe, maybe our boss uh, fires us. Maybe somebody lies to us. Maybe somebody deceives us. Maybe, maybe somebody goes around our back and stabs us in the back. Maybe something uh, just horrible happens to us. God forbid we lose somebody in our family. God forbid uh, uh, we, we, we find ourselves in a financial crisis. God forbid we find ourselves in a, in a health crisis. Where all of a sudden these trees fall down and, 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 it's, a, and it's our life crashing down. But it doesn't just affect us. These trees that fell over, they fell on this house and destroyed it. And so they destroyed somebody else's life. And then all that's left to show for it's a stump. <laughs> and every day we got to go out of our house and look at this stump. That reminds us of the hurt that we've been through. And this stump is good for nothing but to rot. And that's exactly what will happen to us if we just allow these things to happen to our life, these storms of life to come in without forgiving. We become the stump. But the good news, Shannon wasn't God yesterday, but he was doing what God does. And let me tell you something, he didn't get rid of that stump in five minutes. It took a lot longer than that. But he came in there with the right tools. And he began working away at that stump. And listen to me. After about two hours of grinding that stump, grinding that stump, grinding on that stump, finally, he got to the place where that stump was no longer there. She's going to walk out of that house from here on out and never see that stump again. And I got to thinking, that's unforgiveness in our life. It's sitting there looking at that stump every day. The reminder of what happened to us. And the tragedy of us not responding with forgiveness. It's not doing a thing to that person. But it's looking at me every day and reminding me of what happened. And it is rotting me on the inside. Just like that stump is rotting from the inside. Shannon got out of his tractor and he said, man, that, that inside is gone. He said, all the meat is still around on the outside. That's us. Walking away rotten on the inside, but we look pretty darn good on the outside. Because we refuse to say, I forgive you. You messed up. Absolutely. And we're going to have to, we're going to have to do some grinding. We're going to have to do some grinding. There's a process. It's bit by bit. But we're going to get there. Amen. I forgive you. But there's a lot of work to be done. There is a lot of grinding to be done. I find it interesting that this tree that was, uh, that, that the stump that he was, was grinding down came from a tree that didn't blow over from the storm. If it finally got to the place where they were going to have to cut it down, it was, it, was, it was endangering everything around it. And they still had, so they had to cut it down. 
and is still left that stump. So even if we think we've got everything under control, we, we, we think we, we, we think we cut it off at the right, at the right place, we still are going to have to deal with what's left. But that's the hardest part. We don't want to deal with it. We want to put it off to the side. We want to worry about it later. But we've got to deal with it now. We've got to forgive now. Healing comes from forgiveness. It doesn't come from unforgiveness. You cannot be healed when you unforgive, when you, when you do not forgive. You'll carry it the rest of your life. And listen to me. It is not healthy. It's not healthy from an emotional standpoint. It's not healthy from a physical standpoint. Maybe the reason some of us are sick is because we are unforgiven. So I'm just saying, it, 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 it messes with us in many different ways. And we're all there. And unless you live in a bubble, unless you never get outside, unless, you, unless you're perfect, all of us have been affected. We've all been hurt. We, we all have people in our life that we need to say, I forgive you. I forgive you. Now let's begin the process of working this out. We're going to set up some boundaries. We're going to be praying about this. We're going to be working through this. But we're going to get there. I'm not going to spend the rest of my life hating you. You don't care. It's not affecting you. But I'm not going to spend the rest of my life hating you. I'm not going to spend the rest of my life carrying a grudge. I'm going to deal with it right now. So I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and, and close your eyes.